Um, just for anybody that wasn't here at the very beginning of the session this morning, um, please feel free to put any um, questions that you might have about the, to the speakers or about the talks um, into the Q&A box um, and we'll be going through those at the end of the morning and afternoon sessions. So um, we won't be continuing with questions straight away immediately after the talk. So um, we now have our first uh, pre-recorded talk which is uh, from Peter Cox uh, of AC Archaeology. Um, Peter is currently the director of AC Archaeology, but he's been around for a very long time. Um, he's been employed in the field and in post-excavation for over 40 years, uh, and he's currently very much looking forward to retiring. Um, he's going to talk about a site on the south side of the city, a second rural site, um, down in Wadden. Um, many sites uh, get the uh, epithet. Uh, multi-phase, but I think this one um, in particular <laughs> merits that. Um, Martin, uh, please could you play Peter's recorded video? Good morning everybody. My name's Peter Cox from AC Archaeology and this morning I'll be talking about archaeological investigations that we undertook right down at the southern end of the Gloucester city boundary uh, adjacent to the, the main railway line uh, from Bristol, um, west of the village of Wadden, on land that was formerly part of Tuffley Farm. The archaeological work on site has been required both to achieve a planning consent and subsequently to discharge conditions relating to archaeology for a large housing development um, that, if many of you know the area, will probably have seen it, uh, it's well underway. It's involved building survey undertaken in 2018, geophysical survey in 2016, trial trenching in 2016 by uh, Rubicon, and we undertook the excavations in 2019. Since then, the finds and records have undergone a process of assessment and we're now underway with the full analysis, preparing a publication report that's due to be issued later this year. This slide shows the location of the buildings that were recorded prior to development. The left hand map shows the location of a small enclosure of what was essentially a square arrangement of farm buildings around a central farmyard just south of Grange Road. The main Tuffley farm complex lay to the north, and you'll see this again on later plans. And that had probably gone by the 1970s. So this remnant of farm buildings needed recording prior to the works going ahead to develop the site. And it was a rather nice L-shaped barn of the late 18th century, probably early 19th century, uh, in red brick with rather nice Flemish garden bond brickwork. The top photo shows the um, side view of it and the, the bottom photo shows the, the gable end of the structure with a, a blocked original window in it. This sadly has now been demolished. The earliest building um, in this range uh, was open-sided into the centre of the farmyard and uh, revealed some really quite fine timber work supporting uh, the, the roof on the open side. All this has been recorded and is now in the historic environment record. This slide shows the results of the geophysical survey undertaken in 2016 uh, and this is the effectively the grayscale uh, results. You'll see at the very bottom uh, of the site, southeast corner, there's some quite strong rectilinear anomalies. These haven't been further investigated because they lay outside the area of uh, development at that time. But just to the west of that, or northwest, is the is a quite significant curvilinear feature, which you'll you'll see again shortly. But the dominant effect on the magnetic uh, signature on the site has been these long linear strands, which are the re remnants of ridge and furrow cultivation. 
the cultivation has affected the survival of the archaeology to quite an extent um, and uh, I'll return to this again later on as well. This slide shows the interpretation of the magnetometer results. Um, the ridge and furrow has been left off it because it would tend to mask most things. You can see at the bottom southeast corner the rectilinear enclosures that I mentioned just now. Um, these haven't been investigated. We don't know the date of these. Uh, they're outside the development area and weren't subject to trial trenching. But to the northwest of there in the southern end, there's um, the curvilinear features I referred to, and uh, I'll provide some more information about those shortly. Up at the top corner, the apex of the site where virtually where Grange Road uh, meets the railway line, uh, you can see there's some yellow features marked there. These are slightly lighter uh, anomalies, but we investigated these and uh, I'll describe those shortly. And again, in the northeast corner, there's a group of yellow uh, slighter anomalies, again, which we've uh, we've examined in, in the full excavation phase. And this slide shows the plan of the actual archaeological features that were revealed following the topsoil strip. The entirety of the area uh, within the red line boundary was stripped under archaeological supervision. And while there were traces of ridge and furrow um, uh, within that area, these are the areas where the principal features were, were concentrated. We've denoted it area A in the north top of the site area B in the southwest corner, area C in the southeast, and then there's a smaller area D alongside Grange Road. Two further things to note is that the north corner was extremely boggy. Uh, it was the lower part, lowest part of the site and uh, it was really quite difficult conditions there. But also to bring your attention to the little brook or stream that runs just par parallel with Grange Road to the north of it, just south of Bybrook Gardens. And this is the Bybrook. Um, and I'll be making further reference to that shortly. The earliest evidence we found on the site was a paleo channel, a former tributary probably to the Bybrook uh, that ran through that boggy northern area heading uh, sort of southeast towards the brook. It contained a whole series of silts um, and originally would probably formed either through natural catchment drainage or sometimes these channels were formed for, from outwash uh, water during uh, melting during interglacial periods. You can see here some of the detail of the deposits within the Paleo channel uh, that were sampled for things like pollen and diatoms to try and consider the what the natural environment was like at the time. Sadly, the, the pollen really wasn't well preserved at all uh, and we weren't able to get, gather really any useful information from that perspective. But it did enable us to use um, OSL dating uh, to derive some dates of the deposits. And you can see on the right hand screen, there's one date there of about 8000 plus or minus 1900 BC. And I think on the left hand screen, there's one that's about 6000 um, BC. So we're looking at a, a, a stream system that was filling up during the Mesolithic period. But sadly, it doesn't provide a lot more information about the early history of the site. But uh, it, there's few of these have been examined in any great detail. So it's quite a useful addition to, to regional data. And interestingly, in the same area as the um, Paleo Channel, that northern corner of the site, we recovered a polished stone axe from the subsoil. It wasn't in any particularly sort of sealed deposit, um, but it was rather a, a surprise um, and is, is one of the great Langdale group of axes and is, is clearly uh, Neolithic in date. And 
is comparable to one found not too far away at Robinswood back in the 1950s. We intend to do some thin sectioning on this and, and get its source uh, more closely provenanced. But other than that, there was very little in the way of prehistoric activity on the site. There was a handful of isolated pits of Bronze Age date, uh, a couple of sherds of beaker pottery from the later Neolithic, early Bronze Age period, um, and a small scatter of Middle and later Iron Age pottery. But uh, prehistoric activity on the site was really very much limited to these, this stray find and the, the Paleo Channel um, back in the, in the Mesolithic period. Turning now to the Roman phase of activity, um, down in that southwest corner, Area B, the curvilinear features that we'd picked up on the magnetometer survey, uh, we've been able to show were part of a Romano-British enclosure. The ditch wasn't terribly deep and there was no internal features within this enclosure to give us any hint as to whether it was a settlement feature or whether it was an agricultural enclosure. There was a moderate quantity of pottery from the site which dated it to the first, later 1st or 2nd century AD and, and of quite a small animal bone assemblage, half of which was uh, by weight was taken up by a complete skeleton of a dog. Um, there was very little in the way of charred remains to, to give us a hint about any other activities on the site. But scraps of tegula were recovered in this area and stray finds across the rest of the site, perhaps suggesting that just outside the area uh, that we excavated, there may well have been a, um, a Roman building. The next phase of activity on the site was from the medieval period and corresponds with the two areas in the north and northeast corners of the site where the magnetometer survey had shown these these slightly uh, slighter magnetic anomalies clustered uh, in the uh, position shown on this plan and this plan shows the medieval features in the north part of the site in our area a and comprises a series of short lengths of linear ditches uh, and a cluster of pits. We're fairly convinced that most of these ditches on the northeast southwest alignment are traces of ridge and furrow, which probably is slightly later in the medieval sequence than the pits. But the pits themselves are of great interest. None of them seem to indicate a structure within this area, but there's sufficient material in them to, to, to date them. The pottery recovered uh, includes a, an earlier Saxo-Norman group, um, which includes East Midland shell-tempered wares, um, probably from the 10th, 11th century. But most of them in that era, that earlier medieval period, are of, mo of local Cotswold or lithic tempered fabric, with a few imported Malvernian wares. There's a later phase of ceramics as well, uh, taking us up to the 13th and 15th centuries, uh, which includes mostly um, Cotswold and Malvernian ware um, predominantly. The pits have provided us with some information about the local agricultural economy. Um, a, 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 again, a relatively modest collection of animal bones includes sheep, goat, pig, um, horse, chicken, and uh, and the remains of a mole, which is uh, most interesting, I think. Um, the half of that assemblage by weight was also taken up with a single cattle uh, burial in, in one of the pits. We also had lots of carbonized seeds and charred plants remains, which indicated uh, a predominance of cereals um, like bread wheat, durum wheat, rye, barley and oats at various times in the medieval period, uh, but also um, some more arable, arable crops in the form of horse beans and peas were recovered. 
These features are a clear indicator of settlement in this area, albeit in this quite boggy zone. Um, and one suspects that either there were timber structures here that have been swept away by later ploughing, or that there may have been uh, stone structures nearby, but possibly outside the, the area of the excavation. And, uh, and then in the northeast corner of the site in our area D, there was a further cluster of, of features related to medieval activity. Um, these seem less like these are the blue ones on the screen. Um, these seem less likely to be to do with uh, ridge and furrow and may actually be part of a small enclosure. But again, there's no hard evidence for a, a structure there. The, the pink um, coloured features on the, on the plan are of post-medieval date and relate to later field divisions. And uh, while I don't yet have any photographs of the uh, medieval pottery from the site, uh, I do at least have this rather splendid example of an of a earthenware platter, um, probably 18th or 19th century in date, but could be as early as the later 17th century. Um, which was found almost intact in one of the features, uh, the post-medieval features in, in Area D. One of the pits in Area A that contained pottery up to the 13th century um, also contained this small iron knife blade. It's a Saxon form, a uh, late Saxon form probably, um, and is called a sea axe. But I have to warn you, the next slide I'm going to show you isn't ours. This is one from the British Museum. And indeed, this is a rather fine example from the British Museum. Um, it's a, a pattern welded knife. Um, and this particular example has these rather elaborate um, dog tooth uh, decoration and various inlays on the the back of the of the of the blade. And here is the X-ray of of our knife blade. This is um, you can see the the line of of teeth marks uh, in the centre of the knife. Uh, there's 18 of them in total, um, and then a series of bands of of pattern welded metal um, behind and above that. It's a form which is actually uh, does have close parallels in London um, uh, and uh, Mortimer Wheeler who did a typology of these in, in back in 1935. Uh, it's close close example of one that he referred to as a Scramasax type 4. Um, but it's a a rather splendid object um, and I can now show you what it looks like in its conserved state where um, if you look very closely you can see the central line and there's just a hint of the of the dog tooth sort of pattern underneath it but sadly uh, a lot of the detail is actually in the corrosion we don't take any more off for fear of, of losing any of this pattern but I think the X-ray really tells us just what a nice example it would have been. I'm told by Andy Armstrong that um, Gloucester Museum has a scabbard for one of these. And uh, I'd like to think that when this is eventually ends up in the museum, it might actually fit. But uh, that would be pushing our luck, I think. So while the occurrence of individual artefacts is uh, particularly of, of note, um, and the Roman settlement at um, Tuffley uh, may be compared to sites over to the west towards Quedgley. There are one or two aspects of the medieval and later um, settlement evidence that we found here, which I think are worth commenting on. On this map of Gloucester in 1624, I've ringed the area uh, around Tuffley, and the next slide shows this in a little more detail. Uh, this is the extract of the um, 17th century map, 
uh, where you can see Tuffley Square in the centre of the of the map, um, denoted by small structures and uh, an oval-shaped circuit, which I'm not altogether clear may indicate the presence of a moat. Um, but it's clearly it's a separate se uh, settlement from Wadden to the south, and you can see the church to the southwest there. The Tuffley had a uh, an unusual status. Um, it was anciently a constituent of a city parish of St Mary de Lode, and so it was some distance from the uh, centre of that parish. And that owes its origins to a complicated division of land holdings of various hamlets around Gloucester between the Crown, Gloucester Abbey and the former Minster of St Oswald. Tuffley had been given to uh, Gloucester Abbey uh, in the 11th century and those estates were um, consolidated into the irregular parish of St Mary de Lode uh, uh, eventually. Wadham Hill Field, include, which includes the site, lies at the stream southern edge of the parish and much closer to the centre of Wadham and Quedgley, whose tenants also farmed in the, in the Tuffley area. This rather fine um, but sadly undated estate map from round about 1800 shows the site that we were looking at in some detail and it clearly gives no hint of the medieval settlement that we found um, uh, on the northern fringes. It does however show quite clearly in the southern portion outside the red line um, the presence of former strip fields and it's fairly clear that a number of those that run through our in investigation area are consolidations of former furlongs. This slightly later map of 1834, which interestingly has been used to, to mark on the light line of the forthcoming railway, um, you can see at the bottom the strip fields were still important. They've been penciled in uh, on this map. So at some point after 1834, it was still of relevance. In fact, the final enclosure of the fields in Tuffley didn't take place until the 1860s. This map also clearly shows the existence of the Tuffley farm on the north side of Grange Road and the presence of the three-sided uh, barn to the south. Nowhere is there any hint of the fact that the, there was medieval settlement on the south side of Grange Road. This um, map extract is from the St Mary de Lode tithe map and uh, we've added the field names from the apportionment onto it and it tells us something about the complexity of the land holding here. You can see that a number of the fields in the southeast corner are farmed from uh, the manors of Wadden and Quedgley. Um, the field name Lanes is of interest. It's the one that contains the L-shaped barn that was the subject of the building recording. And Lanes is just another name for um, arable land. Bottoms in the top left hand corner is the area that we already knew was very low lying and Bottoms is a name often applied in strip fields to those furlongs in the lowest part of the field so it confirms what we already had discovered. Five lands is of interest as well. Lands is, is a synonym for a cellian or a strip uh, and that's proof positive that this central area where we found all the ridge and furrow was actually being farmed as, as strip fields. None of it, however, gives us any hint from the field names in themselves that this area had previously had medieval settlement on it, and that remains the enigma. And so we have it. I must apologise, I'm not very familiar with doing online lecturing and it's only when I play this back I hear how many ums and stutters there are in it. Um, I beg your indulgence on these matters uh, but uh, I trust that you found this of interest and 
thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks very much to Peter for sending in that interesting talk. I was particularly fascinated by the uh, late Saxon um, findings from that site. Um, now we have uh, five minutes until the due time for our comfort break, but I, I suggest we take it now. Um, then we'll have more time either for chat at the end of the morning or for lunch. Um, so if we take a break and we'll start again at 11 minutes past 11. Thank you very much. <laughs>